going. Um, yeah. welcome, welcome everyone. Thank you very much for uh, coming to this, the fourth of our interdisciplinary PGR, Southampton Institute for Arts and Humanities uh, seminar events. Um, I am delighted to welcome Alyssa Caroline, who is going to be speaking to us about, I thought I'd found my purpose, or at least a hobby, representations of female serial killers in the contemporary Victorian Gothic and who doesn't love the Gothic? Uh, so Alyssa Caroline, I will um, hand over straight away to you. Um, Alyssa, was, Alyssa Caroline will speak for about 30 minutes and then we'll have lots of time for discussion, comment, questions, etc. Thank you so much, I'm looking forward to it. Okay, so uh, first of all, thank you all so much for coming. And I wanted to begin by saying that most people tell me that they find my work pretty interesting. But beyond that, you know, aside from the interesting bits, people want to know why my work matters and what it contributes both to academia and to life in general. And when this question comes up, I always say that I think my work matters primarily because it offers us a new way of reading forgotten female voices. Female serial killers are rare in this day and age, and most people are flabbergasted when I explain that they existed in the 19th century as well. Even today, we most commonly see female serial killers who kill in relatively nonviolent ways. For example, angels of death, nurses who sneakily administer poison to patients, women who shoot abusive partners in self-defense, but very rarely do we uncover cases of women who commit blatant acts of torture and sadism, especially upon multiple victims. Those murders are more commonly the domain of famous male serial killers, such as Ed Kimber, Jeffrey Dahmer, and Carol Cole, just to name a few. I analyzed all of these serial killers in my MA dissertation when I compared them to Delphine Lalari, who you'll be hearing a lot about in this presentation. And I used the principles of forensic psychology to analyze the similarities they shared with a female serial killer from the 19th century. But for this research project, I wanted to expand on that and go beyond Delphine's case. Having already done a great deal of work on the historical reality of Delphine's case, I wanted to use this research as an opportunity to explore the differences between the historical representation afforded to the real Delphine by the media of her day and the updated portrayal she received by the television series, American Horror Story Coven. I also wanted to compare and contrast these portrayals of a serial killer from the American South with the representation of a British female serial killer, Lucille Sharp, as seen in the film Crimson Peak. I think my research on this topic is valuable because neither of these films have ever been the subject of academic analysis. While there are, of course, film reviews for both visual texts, that's a far cry from a scholarly critique which seeks to contribute something new to the field of literary criticism. And at the core, I think that's why my research matters. In today's political climate, we are intensely concerned with women's rights and representations, especially where that involves women who, in some way, transgress against our social norms. So I think visual texts like Crimson Peak and Coven constitute a new genre which address this concern by reaching back into the past to shine a light on underrepresented women who deviate from society's expectations. These visual texts feature 19th century antiheroines in the contexts of their own time and place, but they invite us as the viewers to consider Lucille and Delphine through the lens of 21st century morality. They invite us to see them as real women who were capable of telling their own stories, and they encourage us to ask what might have become of these women in a different time and place. So because these texts involve all of these variables, some modern, some Victorian, I have termed this genre the contemporary Victorian Gothic, and I use that lens to explore these films within the context of literary criticism, feminism, and Victorianist scholarship. So with all of that context established, let's just dive right into the meat of the research. So in the early hours of the morning on December 8th, 1894, 15-year-old Emily Newber repeatedly punched a baby in the face. The baby's name was Ray Myers, and a scant five days before the incident occurred, Emily had accepted a trial position as the baby's live-in nanny. Emily's assault on the baby was very quickly noticed, and she was questioned almost immediately. In response to her employee's que employer's questions, Emily said simply, I don't know. I don't know anything about it. I never did it. The Myers family couldn't prove that Emily had harmed Ray, but they still had some pretty solid suspicions. Only a few days later, those suspicions were confirmed, but unfortunately by that point, it was much too late for Ray. The next time Emily was accused of harming the baby, Mr. Myers found her standing on the staircase, staring blankly at the baby in her arms while Ray convulsed and, convulsed and dribbled white frothy vomit down the stairs. Ray died less than an hour later. An autopsy later confirmed that Ray had been fed an entire bottle of acetic acid. 
A search of Emily's room confirmed the family's suspicions when Mrs. Myers found an empty bottle of acid nestled among Emily's belongings. Once again, Emily was questioned by Mr. Myers as he desperately attempted to find out why she had repeatedly harmed his daughter. And once again, Emily insisted that she knew nothing about the incident, but she didn't stick to that story. Prior to her arrest, Emily changed her story five or six times. After initially insisting that she had no idea what had happened to Ray, she would later imply that she was being framed, that this was a massive misunderstanding, that the other nannies who worked for the family, or even the Myers young children, all of whom were under six years old, had somehow conspired together to poison Ray and get Emily fired. Emily's denial would later baffle judge, jury, and the team of medical professionals who examined her during her trial at the Old Bay. As Emily's trial dragged on for days, multiple legal and medical professionals debated the appropriate diagnosis for someone like Emily. One doctor suggested she was hysterical, while another was quick to dismiss this assessment, arguing that Emily's unnervingly calm demeanor stood in disturbing contrast to every symptom of hysteria. Another doctor remarked that it might actually be a relief if she was indeed hysterical. But in the end, after a great deal of debate, Emily received the nebulous diagnosis of homicidal mania and was sentenced to one week in prison and five years in a mental institution. The latter sentence was tacked on after it was discovered that Emily had previously served as a nanny in two separate households and each time killed the child in her care. Interestingly, despite the highly disturbing nature of Emily's crimes, her sentencing is the last history ever hears of her. We know nothing else about her past, her future, or what motivated her to kill three children in three different households. And that's exactly why I wanted to begin by discussing Emily Newber. Because even though she is not the primary focus of my research, I think Emily's story is significant because it sets a few intriguing precedents for our understanding of murderous Victorian era women. So let's take a look at a few of the reasons why Emily's case is particularly interesting. Firstly, Emily's story illustrates the connection between violence and vulnerability that is commonly seen in 19th century murders committed by women. When Victorian women killed, they primarily murdered victims who were made vulnerable by dependents, children, elderly parents, etc. And we can clearly see this in Emily's case. Secondly, Emily's story highlights the fact that many female murderers of the 19th century used poison as their weapon of choice. Because poison was accessible, often undetectable, and easily administered through a victim's food or drink, poison was a very convenient weapon for many female serial killers of this era. And finally, Emily's story suggests that violent female murderers were a source of confusion to the medical and legal professionals of her day. And because my research interrogates the representation and reality of female murderers in the 19th century, I'm especially interested in the psychiatric community's response to women like Emily, because this history lays the groundwork for my analysis of the two serial killers I want to talk about today. So, meet Delphine Mallory and Lucille Sharp. As you can see here, we're going to be looking at two very different women from two different time periods and countries, but despite these differences, it's the similarities they share that really fascinate me. Before I go any further, however, I want to point out that both Lucille and Delphine are, to a degree, fictional. Delphine Lalaurie was a real woman who lived and operated an attic torture chamber in New Orleans in 1834. But for the purpose of my study today, we're going to be looking at her fictional portrayal through the television series American Horror Story Cut. Uh, so Delphine was a real person, but Lucille, depicted on the right here in the film Crimson Peak, is completely fictional. However, in crafting her character, director Guillermo del Toro did a great deal of research on underrepresented and unknown female serial killers like Emily Newber. So he wrote Lucille kind of as an amalgamation of many of these women. So now that we've established this background, I wanna kind of start by situating these women within the context of their time and place, and then we're gonna move on to explore their case studies in more specific detail. So for starters, we need to establish some general context about the societal norms and cultural attitudes that characterize the general public's view of women in the 19th century. In her critical analysis, Women, Crime and Custody in Victorian England, criminology scholar Lucia Zedner posits that female criminality in the 19th century could only be read and understood through the lens of Victorian morality. That's because this concept of morality informed the Victorian perception of socially acceptable femininity and the behavior that transgressed against the complex, carefully constructed notion of ideal womanhood. Sedner also posits that the definition of the ideal woman was tied closely to her role within the family and home. In turn, the family was central to middle-class morality, according to which it served as a sanctuary for the preservation of traditional moral and religious values. Thus, one can infer that when women like Lucille and Delphine violate these norms through acts of violence, 
they are not only transgressing against the law, but against the standard of ideal womanhood, which defines the entire social order. This theory is supported by Zedner's observation that in early Victorian England, here we go. <clears throat> In early Victorian England, the woman who had fallen through sexual misconduct, drunkenness, or criminality became the subject of a mass literature. To avoid being stigmatized as witch or fallen woman, women were obliged to conform to the prescribed patterns of acceptable female behavior of their time. And I have completely lost my place because the slides transitions have messed up. Um, to fail to do so it was lost them all claim to the respect of decent society. So if you're denied access to economic or political power, women gain coveted social status through this respectability, which as a result is likely to be of considerable importance to them. Respectability can therefore be seen as a type of social currency that a woman could lose at any time through any social violation, no matter how big or small. But earning that respectability came with a price, a strict set of limitations on a woman's behavior. So if women in the 19th century are already living with a stringent set of prescribed limitations governing everything from what you can wear, who you can talk to, what you're allowed to read, you can only imagine how much committing violent murder transgresses against these restrictions. Now, technically committing murder is socially unacceptable for anyone, but Victorian criminologist Judith Nauman has observed that, as with many things, murder was much more acceptable for men than it was for women. For example, many of the traits that were associated with socially acceptable manhood, such as bravery, dominance, and assertiveness, could easily be called into play during a brawl or a bar fight and many other scenarios where another male opponent might wind up dead. So even though murder is still criminalized for anyone, the public can much more easily understand murder as an unhealthy exaggeration of male traits under certain circumstances. For women, of course, this was absolutely never the case. As a result, the stigma and fear of losing respectability was often enough to prevent most women from engaging in criminal behavior. In spite of that, however, Lucille and Delphine were absolutely not outliers. They are by no means the only female serial killers of their day. But to refer back to the case of Emily Newber, we'll notice that most female serial killers, such as Catherine Wilson, Sarah Chesham, and Betty Eccles, tended to use poison. What sets Lucille and Delphine apart is the fact that they were very comfortable with extreme violence and even torture. And 19th century female serial killers who actually tortured their victims were very rare indeed. So with that context established, let's take a look at their specific cases. We're gonna start with Delphine. So Delphine Waller reed was a social item plantation owner in 1834 New Orleans. By the time she was 30, she had been married four times and given birth to six children. Her first marriage occurred when she was only 14 and she was the heiress to a substantial fortune. As her husbands died under increasingly mysterious circumstances, she continued to inherit their wealth as well. By the time she married her fourth and final husband, the much younger and relatively penniless Dr. Louis Lollery, she actually owned their 13 bedroom mansion on Royal Street herself. And by all accounts, it seems that Delphine would have much preferred to carry on being the sole owner of the mansion. But due to the social restrictions on acceptable feminine behavior, she needed a husband who could at least serve as a figurehead to maintain her respectability even if he was much younger and quite possibly married to her against as well. Letters Louis wrote to friends during this time suggest that she actually trapped him in the marriage with pregnancy scare that was later revealed to be entirely false. And what's interesting is that many of these historical elements are supported in American Horror Story's portrayal of Delphine. When we meet her in the first five minutes of the show's opening episode, she, Louis, and their oldest daughter have congregated in Delphine's attic torture chamber to watch Delphine torture her latest victim. At one point early in this scene, Libby even stands back to admire her work and remarks that Delphine has really outdone herself this time before asking her what inspired her newest torture method. This scene immediately tells us quite a few things. Firstly, we can see that Delphine's torture chamber is not a secret from her family. Not only do they know what she does in the attic, it can be inferred that they are both actively involved and supportive, even if only as an attempt to avoid winding up in the attic as victims themselves. Secondly, we can also see that Delphine wields an extraordinary amount of power in her family, certainly much more so than her husband. And lastly, the scene also implies that Delphine's intimate relationship with violence is what afforded her this unprecedented amount of power and control. Interestingly, all of these details are supported by historical records regarding Delphine, but it's the differences in the portrayals that really stand out to me. For example, Coven recreates many of the scenes which we find in historical records, such as Louis' accounts of Delphine's torture chamber and the moment when the townspeople of New Orleans stormed the mansion and broke into the attic to see for themselves. Coven's portrayal takes a vastly different approach from written accounts like this article, 
from Louisiana B in April 1834, which described Delphine as a demon in the shape of a woman. Another article in April 1834 wrote that the sight was so horrible we could scarcely look upon it. The most savage heart could not have witnessed the spectacle unmoved. One victim had a large hole in his head. His body from head to foot was covered with scars and filled with worms. The sight inspired us with so much horror that even at the moment of writing this article, we shudder from its effects. The article later went on to re reiterate that Delphine could not be a woman, but rather a fiend. So as you can see from the language of both pieces, it's clear that unsexing Delphine is central to the article's descriptions. They are so incapable of coping with the reality that a woman, especially a socialite and prominent member of high society, could commit these atrocities that they can only process Delphine's actions by concluding that she is inhuman and almost supernaturally evil. This is very much in keeping with the ideology of Delphine's time, because if we think back to Zender's reflection on 19th century morality, a woman's role as the pure and moral center of the home is crucial to the foundation of the entire social order. So in short, we can infer that if someone like Delphine disrupts that status quo, her actions would be viewed as tumultuous and unconscionable on a very broad scale, and therefore no one can allow themselves to even acknowledge it. By contrast, Coven completely rejects 19th century morality and invites us to perceive Delphine in the same way that a viewer would see any other horror movie villain. Coven makes no attempt to shock us with the fact that Delphine is both a woman and a serial killer. Rather, it simply introduces her to us as the sadistic villain of the show. But what I find so compelling about this portrayal is the fact that Coven successfully straddles the line between two time periods in its depiction of Delphine. Unlike 19th century portrayals of female serial killers, whether in fiction or in newspapers like the ones we've looked at, Coven does not attempt to unsex Delphine or encourage viewers to recoil with horror at the fact that she's female. Neither does the show attempt to tell Delphine's story by an omniscient and presumably male proxy. Rather than telling us the story through a third person narrator, Coven invites us to engage with Delphine as a person and hear her story in her own words. Throughout its long, gory close-ups of the attic, and the many life events that led Delphine to create her own torture chamber. Coven makes it clear that Delphine is a 19th century villain with some beliefs and conventions that are the product of her time, while also hinting that evil is both timeless and universal. For example, Coven places a great deal of emphasis on sadism and racism as two of Delphine's primary motivations. These motivations serve as a touchstone that help us transcend the gap between our time period and Delphine's. On one hand, we can observe that as a plantation owner in 1834, her overt racism would have been socially acceptable in her day. But Coven also makes an effort to show that even if Delphine's motives were common in her day, they are still universally and unequivocally repugnant. And in a weird time traveling twist that has Delphine interacting with women of color in 2016, Coven connects Delphine's past with the present quite literally to observe that the cause motives such as sadism and racism have continued to incite violence in our own day. We can bridge the distance between 1834 and the present, see Delphine as a villain who would be equally evil and scary in our day or her own. This representation is what motivated me to term shows like Coven the contemporary Victorian Gothic. Because although Coven makes no attempt to modernize or update Delphine for the contemporary viewer, it does blur the lines between period peace and horror to make us fear and engage with a 19th century villain. It also relies heavily on the conventions of 19th century Gothic fiction. For example, drawing on physical and psychological terror, hints of the supernatural and uncanny, along with a heavy dose of madness and mystery. But rather than portraying these tenets through the written word as in a penny dreadful or gothic novel, Coven updates its depictions by showing these gothic conventions via the visual medium of a deeply gory horror series. Thus, at the end of the day, we get kind of get the best of both worlds. A 19th century villain depicted through the tenets of a gothic novel with the visual terror and relatability of a 2016 horror film. So as a result of this contemporary Gothic portrayal, Delphine becomes more accessible to the audience and has allowed more agency when it comes to telling her own story. Likewise, the portrayal of Crimson Peak's Lucille Sharp is very similar. Set in Cumbria in 1887, Crimson Peak makes it clear from the beginning that this is a period piece and a very Gothic one at that. Uh, so just to give you a brief plot synopsis, Crimson Peak centers around the story of Edith Cushing, who you can see here on the right an American heiress and aspiring author who unexpectedly falls in love with British aristocrat Thomas Sharp. Against the advice of absolutely everyone in her life, Edith becomes obsessed with her desire to marry Thomas and move with him to his manor in house in England, a decaying mansion that the Cumbrian locals call Crimson Peak. But we learn early on that Thomas and Edith's love story has one significant roadblock, Thomas's sister and lover, Lucille. 
In his biography notes for Lucille's character, Del Toro frequently remarks that costumes are key to understanding her because her clothes are designed to communicate certain things to the viewer, as you can kind of see in this picture here. So firstly, uh, in, in keeping with the conventions of Victorian Gothic novels, villains are often characterized by the darkness of their clothes and or appearance. So to this point, Lucille is almost exclusively dressed in black or blood red every time we see her. This is especially obvious in her first scene when we meet her at the piano wearing this dress. The slide transitions are out of order, this dress. Um, so this scene also provides us with another important cue about Lucille, her socioeconomic status. So if we go back, we can see that Edith, uh, the heroine, is clearly dressed in the latest fashion and characterized by light, pure colors such as white and yellow. By contrast, as you can see in this scene, Lucille's clothes are very elegant, but very out of date for her time. These subtle details hint at the fact that fashionable American Edith represents the rising figure of the new woman, while Lucille embodies the decline of the British aristocracy. The film continues to reinforce this point by repeatedly presenting Edith as the foil to Lucille. Edith's clothes, combined with her plucky optimism, determination, and intensely American can-do attitude, reinforce the suggestion that Edith represents light, purity, and the forging of a new future. By contrast, whenever we see these characteristics in Edith, we are treated to contrasting glimpses of Lucille, which are characterized by black, dr black dresses, blood-stained hands, and a weird fetish for dead moths and butterflies whose wings Lucille has plucked. Uh, in one particularly creepy scene uh, depicted here on screen, Lucille actually brushes Edith's cheeks with the wings of a butterfly she's about to pull apart. On multiple occasions, Lucille also references the black moths that are native to Crimson Peak and the fact that they eat butterflies while making intense eye contact with Edith. This detail, of course, suggests that Lucille sees herself as the moth which preys on butterflies like Edith. In his character notes on Lucille, Del Toro asserts that all of these details have been specifically curated to tap into the style of the Victorian Penny Dreadful and hint to the reader that Lucille is the villain of this story. Del Toro also gives us a few behind the scenes glimpses at Lucille's serial murder career by providing viewers with stealthy shots of Lucille stirring an unidentified substance into Edith's tea before serving it to her with barely disguised insistence. This detail is a subtle nod to the female serial killers like Emily Newber that Del Toro researched for this film. It's also our first cue that Lucille intends to poison Edith, and a hint that she has probably done this multiple times before. But Del Toro also shows us that unlike many female serial killers of the 19th century, Lucille does not use poison exclusively. In fact, as Edith later discovers, Lucille murdered her parents at the age of 14 by hacking them to death with an ax. This shot comes from the scene in which Lucille happily re relives the details of her, her mother's murder. Now that's a lot of background detail to go into, but I think that background is crucial for establishing context and helping us to understand Lucille. So now that we know a little bit more about Lucille and her role in this film, I want to briefly unpack some details about her motivation and background for a quick character analysis. So for starters, for example, we know what Lucille does, but why she does it is central to my reading of her. So both Covent and Crimson Peak allow Delphine and Lucille the chance to tell their own stories through the kind of classic villain monologues that are common in films where the bad guy gets to explain why they're the bad guy. And in her monologue, Lucille explains that protecting Thomas and preserving the family name has always been her job. Both Lucille and Thomas were severely abused as children, but Lucille often tried to shield Thomas from the worst of it by putting herself in harm's way. Before attempting to kill her, Lucille tells Edith that Thomas is the only thing she has ever loved the only thing that has ever brought her joy, and that their incestuous relationship began while they were very young, partly in response to the abuse they experienced at the hands of both their parents. As the abuse worsened, Lucille ultimately took it upon herself to solve the problem and protect herself and Thomas by murdering their parents. This choice gives us a couple of interesting insights to Lucille's character. So first, we have to bear in mind that she was only 14 when the murders took place. Obviously, killing both their parents would mean that she and Thomas are now orphans, but it's implied that Lucille was too young and immature to fully consider the long-term implications of her decision. Lucille's monologue also hints that she was able to think of nothing but preserving her relationship with Thomas and that she is still obsessed with this goal as an adult. Unfortunately, however, her decision didn't quite accomplish the result that she intended. Uh, the murders were very quickly discovered and she was immediately sentenced to life in a mental institution. This is, of course, another nod to violent young women like Emily Newber, who also killed at a very early age and were quickly sentenced to asylums. I've also noticed some similarities between Lucille's early experience and Delphine's, as both young women experienced traumatic events such as marriage, death, sexual abuse, and murder around the age of 14. 
Coven hints at Delphine's traumatic adolescence as well and implies that she was deeply scarred by the experiences that impacted her during this very formative time. But in Lucille's case, Crimson Peak doesn't attempt to provide us with a very cohesive narrative that ties her traumatic childhood experiences together. After the murders and her subsequent sentencing, the film doesn't make it clear if Lucille was ever released from the asylum or if she somehow managed to escape. But one way or another, she has somehow gotten out and made her way back to Crimson Peak to find Thomas again. Lucille's monologue also suggests that her time in the asylum intensified her determination to protect Thomas and remain in their family home. So she came up with a plan to keep them together and establish a steady income. Thomas would marry wealthy heiresses, convince them to transfer their assets to him, and then Lucille would poison them. When Lucille reveals this to Edith, it is implied that Thomas has never been a truly active participant in the scheme. Much like Delphine's husband, Louis Thomas is a passive figurehead who has more or less surrendered all control to Lucille. And while Thomas appears not to enjoy inflicting pain on anyone, it's clear that Lucille, much like Delphine, draws a great deal of pleasure from hurting others. In their monologues, both Lucille and Delphine also state that they view serial murder as an outlet for the repressed rage and aggression they have no other way to express. Both women state that this rage stems from a lifetime of sexism and inequality in their perspective. As very intelligent and ambitious women, both had aspirations that far outweighed what they were socially permitted to achieve. But torturing others and taking lives seems to give them a chance to play God and reclaim the power and agency they lack in other aspects of their lives. But no matter how much she enjoys causing pain for its own sake, it's also clear that Lucille views her actions as being necessary for her and Thomas's survival. By murdering a string of heiresses and stealing their fortunes, Lucille is able to ensure that she and Thomas remain together and effectively untouchable in their family home. They are also able to maintain the illusion of wealth and success, even though most of their money goes into keeping their dilapidated home alive. So having considered all of these factors, I want to wrap up by taking a look at the similarities Delphine and Lucille share. Although they come from two different countries and slightly different time periods and their circumstances are a bit different, at the core they have a great deal in common. For example, they are both highly intelligent and ambitious women who feel socially and intellectually stunted by the opportunities allowed to them. In multiple points throughout Coven, Delphine remarks that she's always been fascinated by anatomy and that she would have liked to become a surgeon or an anatomist. But as a woman, she was never allowed to pursue these interests, so she began conducting her own bizarre medical experiments on unwilling victims in her attic. Likewise, Crimson Peak makes it clear that Lucille has a brilliant mind and a great deal of musical talent. But Lucille observes that she was forbidden from ever pursuing her interests or attempting to make something of herself. These details clearly indicate that both Lucille and Delphine feel trapped by their positions in society, but that they also feel the need to preserve their way of life by killing the people they perceive as posing a threat to them. For example, in Lucille's case, it's her very status as an upper-class woman that she views as holding her back, yet she is obsessed with preserving the family home and name. Delphine's situation is a bit more complicated because she is a plantation owner who exclusively tortures and kills her slaves. So on the surface, it's a bit harder to see why Delphine would view her slaves as a threat to her way of life. But at multiple points throughout the series, Delphine hints that she is indeed afraid of them, mostly because of her husband. Historically, and in the context of Coven, Louis has multiple affairs with slave women and fathers several children. As a result, Delphine fears that one of these children might grow up and make a claim to the Lalaurie fortune, and thus destabilize both her way of life and her children's inheritance. So on many occasions, Delphine uses this fear as justification for what she does in the attic. So when we read their motivation through this lens, we can see that to an extent, both Lucille and Delphine are killing to protect their way of life and to exercise the rage and frustration they feel as a result of the misog misogyny that restricts them. And when we think about the fact that these women are killing in different manners and across different countries and time periods, I find it interesting that their motivations share so many similarities. At the core, it seems that both of them are frustrated, confused, and using violence as a means of giving themselves a voice in a world that wants them to remain passive and silent. My research does not attempt to exonerate these serial killers or to justify what they did, but I am interested in understanding them. Their portrayals in Crimson Peak and Coven may be fictional, but the fact remains that Delphine was a real person, and Lucille was based on the lives and crimes of many real women like Emily Newbert. And as contemporary horror films seek to give Victorian serial killers a new voice, I think it's important to read and understand them through the lenses of criminology, feminism, and literary criticism. Thank you so much for listening to me today, and I hope you have questions because there's so much more I wanted to say, and I would love to share some more serial killer facts and film trivia with you. Thank you. See if I can stop sharing the screen there.
There we go. Very good. Sorry, just a little bit of pause there while I um I got permission to unmute. Um, <laughs> there we go. <laughs> <laughs> thanks so much, Alyssa Caroline. Um, I'm sure we've got lots of questions and comments. I certainly got um, a bunch of questions and comments, but I don't want to uh, take up too much energy. Uh, people can use the chat to pose questions, and then I can feed that into the feed that into the room. Or if people want to just put their hand up, um, then Anushka and Kana mute, mute you and you can speak if, if, if that's what would make you more comfortable. Um, so Sarah Garner, do we know anything about how their families initially found out about the violence and their reactions? Oh, that's such an interesting question. Thank you, Sarah. Um, not really, to be honest. Um, that's, that's the unfortunate answer to that. Um, with Kevin, it's kind of kind of ambiguous, especially even if we cross a, cross, you know, cross reference this with historical records. Um, the implication is that Delphine was very open about what she did, um, very very much that she was the powerful one in the family, and that Louis kind of felt pressured to go along with whatever she did. Um, it also seems that her blatant abuse and torture was kind of a very well kept secret in the town. Everybody knew it. Nobody did anything about it. Um, so we don't really know how they found out, but we do know that it was pretty common knowledge and that no one attempted to stop her until um, the, the way Delphine's torture chamber was discovered historically and in Coven is that she had chained a slave woman to the kitchen stove for some reason. And this woman in desperation, she was literally being burned alive and in desperation, she set fire to the house hoping that this would draw attention and bring some help. So when that happened, um, the townspeople noticed all the smoke, tried to storm the house, Delphine met them at the gate, so no, it's fine, it's fine, the house is going up in flames, but don't worry, just go back home, it's okay. <laughs> and no, of course, nobody believed that. So eventually the neighbors forced their way into the house um, and that's when they discovered the torture chamber. So that's the biggest discovery that we know about historically and that is represented in Coven. But as far as the answer to your question, that's mostly, mostly what we know. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Ethan, you have a question. Yes. Oh, nearly had you. Ah, good. I can unmute. Finally. <laughs> Finally. So. Hi. <laughs> Hello. Well, firstly, thank you for a wonderful talk. Very, very interesting uh, subject matter. Uh, actually, very close to my own work, which was where I, I, I wanted to, to ask. A lot of my work deals with um, sort of the legacy of Victorian serial killers uh, in relation to um, sort of various things to do with autism. And I'm interested in sort of the concept of queerness here uh, and sort of the idea of a queer taste, um, which, which, which I explore a lot in my work. And I was wondering... Ha, do you see these sort of figures as having a certain queerness about them, if not in a, in a, shall we say, a sexual sense, but certainly in relation to their desires, either for murder or for, one could even read it as a control in a patriarchal uh, society. And certainly there's the, the queerness also of um, the elements of camp that come in with something like horror story and the elements of pastiche so i was wondering on uh, do you have any thoughts on uh, them as queer figures for example very interesting oh it's so cool also i would love to meet for coffee and hear more about your research sometime um <laughs> so th i definitely think there are a few elements of queerness less so sexually um but it, that, that element is still there. Uh, for example, of course, Lucille's relationship with Thomas is incestuous and very complicated, and that's certainly quite unusual. Um, both films also strongly imply that Delphine and Lucille associate violence with their sexuality. Um, there's a very strong implication that they draw more sexual satisfaction from violence than they do from physical relationships, and I find that very interesting. Um, also, I'd like to say it's very true that they are seeking control in a patriarchal world and that they're using violence to do so. And this certainly marks them as outsiders and very much sets them apart from other people that they could connect with. And they both seem to draw a weird amount of pleasure 
from the fact that I think after trying to fit into society unsuccessfully, they have just completely broken away and become outsiders. And I think they're both very okay with that at the time that we meet them in their respective films. And I think that definitely influences their concepts of identity and sexuality. Um, and that's very interesting, but that's, that's kind of what I, what I think off the top of my head that that would be something so interesting to explore in further detail. Thank you so much for that perspective. All right, so we have a question from Anna um, <laughs> about um, other contemporary actions, um, so that you are talking about the court documents, yes. papers, were there any sorts of essays written on these women that show a wider societal reaction? Oh, such a good question. And I know Anna very well. So of course she has come up with the most interesting question. <laughs> um, no, so as far as kind of other reactions, you do see, as I said, more film reviews on both of these, um, both of these shows, more about like how readers are responding to it. Um, how readers respond to Delphine and Lucille specifically, that's more the extent of what you get um, in the modern era. As far as going back into the 19th century and these women's their own times, um, mostly what you get is the newspapers, especially about Delphine. Um, for women like Emily, obviously Lucille is fictional, but for women like Emily Newber and the other people that uh, Lucille is based on, you mostly see court cases, court transcripts, um, and the more publicized ca um, cases, broadsides, vil really villainizing them, again, unsexing them, stripping their very identity as women and making them something monstrous rather than humans. Um, just wanna go back and read your question again to make sure I'm answering it more, <laughs> uh, more thoroughly. As far as the essays, um, there have been a couple of books on Delphine. Um, but they, it's very interesting the approach that these books have taken and they kind of tap into Louisiana folklore. Delphine is a big part of that. Um, there are a number of haunted house tours regarding her mansion. Um, but the books that have been written on Delphine tap into more of the folklore aspect and kind of really ham it up and exaggerate everything to the point of it being almost completely fictional. Um, very exaggerated. So it's, it is about Delphine, but it's not accurate. So, thank you. I've got another question in the chat, but I'm aware that Ryan has had his hand up. Ryan, yes, yeah. ask your question. Hi, just very quickly. Um, I was wondering about other positions, it, because this is kind of a typological study in, in a way. I was, hmm. just, I, I was just kind of, I was wondering if you looked at uh, any other uh, representations of serial killers of other people who are similarly <clears throat> disenfranchised from agency within a white patriarchal, say even colonial setting. Certainly with Louisiana, you've got the plantation and the plantation environment and that whole relation to the slave trade, particularly at that time. So, I mean, are, are you finding, are, are you looking at any of that? And would you, have you found anything along those lines? Yes, definitely. Um, and I, I definitely think that race is a really important undertone, you know, especially with Delphine's case, you can't talk about her story and what she did without talking about race relations and the very racist implications of what she's doing. Um, so that is definitely something I've looked at. As far as the plantation concept with Delphine, it, that's a very interesting thing that I, plays a big part in my research because if you look at um, slave narratives, as well as letters written by female plantation owners, such as Delphine, you see a lot of interesting overlap in that a lot of pla um, female plantation owners were known to be very sadistic, very cruel. Um, but if you cross-reference like that historical background with specific recollections about Delphine from her neighbors, from her family, from newspapers at the time, what you see is that Delphine massively transcended even the bar of exceptional sadism or acceptable sadism at that time. It was very, very, very interesting. And people knew, people knew that she was far more sadistic than even what was considered normal and nobody did anything about it. So I think that's very interesting to consider within the lens of a white patriarchal plantation system. And especially um, reading, we have no letters from Delphine herself, but we do have a lot of newspaper accounts and accounts from other people who were aware of what she did. And it's just really interesting that other people seem to pick up on the fact that this is an outlet of some sort for her. 
Um, we don't ever really, aside from Coven's representation, we don't ever get her interpretation of why she did it. But other people seem to believe that she was doing this as an outlet to exercise control in a society where for whatever reason, she also felt helpless. So I think that's a very interesting angle. I'm going to use my chair's prerogative just to, um, I suppose, um, take, take sort of um, that discussion in a slightly different and I suppose more literary direction. Of course, there's a proliferation of um, Gothics. We have the mock Gothic, the post-colonial Gothic, the Southern Gothic, uh, the slave Gothic, the plantation Gothic. And this, actually the use of Gothic fiction by Mary, everyone from Mary Prince to Toni Morrison. Absolutely to their deployment of gothic conventions right right to, to explore um the, the lives and afterlives of slavery and the plantation economy i was just wondering how you know th that kind of literary use of the gothic how your project might be possibly a bit discomforted i think about that tradition and which kind of leads to the question around this phrase you've got of the contemporary victorian Gothic and what that does for you that the other Gothics that are out there don't do for you. Um, so yeah. it seems in many ways to be part of, you know, of that much thought about and I suppose um, celebrated and critiqued genre of the Southern Gothic. Um, so it's got sort of thinking about that. And maybe if, um, you know, um, I could sort of invite you to sort of segue your answer to <laughs> into Sarah's question, um, sorry, not Sarah's question, uh, Isabel's question uh, about the, I suppose, the concerns that depictions such as Delphine in American Horror Story glamorize female murder and violence. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's the women of Gothic conventions can be um, quite troubling at times. Definitely. Yeah, oh, that, that's a great blend of questions. And thank you for doing it that way. That's great. Um, yeah, so as you say, Delphine's story does kind of touch on many subgenres of Gothic, if you will. Um, so definitely a lot of that Southern Gothic stuff comes into play. I, I think contemporary Victorian Gothic as its own genre is really interesting in the way that Crimson Peak and Coven do it, because they're clearly taking a lot of literary conventions and trying to adapt them for the screen. Um, and so I think it becomes like its own weird mashup of many genres. And so as far as like how my project is discomforted by it, Victorian, contemporary Victorian Gothic's relationship to all of those many subsets of Gothic, I think there, one thing I've struggled with so far is the fact that I think there are so many threads, so many ways that you could approach this project and so many things that it touches on some tangentially, but even those tangents are very significant to central threads of the plot and central interpretations that you need in order to talk about this topic. Um, so I think it creates a very interesting spider web of scholarship. <laughs> um, but I think it's something I, I repeatedly come up against is how do you separate those threads enough to have a very clear and organized analysis, but how do you also avoid excluding those things at the same time. So it's, I think it makes it very difficult to balance all those subsets of genres and get it into a cohesive narrative that includes all the right things. Um, that's something I don't really have all the answers to yet, but it's something I continue to work on throughout the development of this project. And there's so many things I wanted to talk about within the context of this uh, presentation. Of course, there's only so many things you can fit into one 30 minute presentation. But, um, so to kind of connect that to Isabel's question, I think that's a really, really important question about the fact that it does seem to glamorize those sorts of things. Um, and I do think that throughout throughout certain periods of, of Kevin and Crimson Peak, you definitely see this romanticization of violence to an extent, um, which often occurs, I think, with a lot of villains, uh, especially in contemporary horror. But I think that both Kevin and Crimson Peak are specifically concerned with teaching a moral lesson in a very interesting way. Um, so both of them kind of end by, they both have very different endings, but the one thing that they have in common is that both films end with Delphine and Lucille very solidly punished for everything they've done. Um, so in the end, I think there is, I think it ends without romanticization. I think it ends by saying, 
crime does not pay quite literally. And Delphine, for example, ends up literally trapped in a hell loop. Uh, it's a very, Coven has a lot of ties to the supernatural, to voodoo, it's very, very interesting. So they, the ending kind of invokes all of those things to say that Delphine did not get away with everything she did. Um, so at the end of the show, she dies and is sent to this hell loop where she is a prisoner in her own attic in the same type of cage that she put her victims in. And she is doomed to watch her daughters be tortured for eternity in the same way that she tortured others. And the message is very clearly that she deserves this for what she's done. Um, likewise, Lucille, who is so obsessed with murder, with preserving the family home, with Thomas, uh, she dies, uh, is murdered herself on the property of Crimson Peak and becomes a ghost there who haunts the house. She's doomed to stay there forever, whether she wants to or not, because she spent so much of her life killing others, hurting others in the name of preserving her own wealth and status. And it's a very clear implication that she also deserves this because of what she did and that her crime, the punishment fits her crime. So I think even if there are periods of romanticization and glamorization throughout the show, I think it ends in such a way that really squarely cuts that out and says, you know, this is not a romanticized or glamorous thing. They're both terrible people who deserve to be punished. So thank you. Sorry, that was a long answer. <laughs> That's okay, we've got um, we've got another four minutes in our session. And oh, yes. well, oh, there's so many questions. <laughs> we've got a clutch of questions. Yes, yeah, um, so I'm trying to talk faster. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, perhaps um, I can invite you. Perhaps you could um, send send a reading list to Sarah um, at some point um, by Sarah's email. One of my best friends, so this will not be a problem. <laughs> Great. <laughs> um, and questions around historical questions um, yes. around you know why no one did anything. What were the regional geographical cultural factors in yeah. the of these of these women um so oh, fascinating. perhaps on this there seems to be a lot of interest in the room in the kind of the historical yeah situation. um so if you could speak a little bit more to that perhaps um, yeah definitely i love the um regional and geographical and cultural question that's really interesting um I think the regional and geographical factor plays in less with Lucille, but quite a bit with Delphine. Um, I don't really see anything about Lucille's background or where specifically in England she's positioned that says she is more predisposed to cruelty or that there's anything in her background or social life that would suggest to her that this is more acceptable in this part of the country than in others or for her particular status as an upper class um, woman in a British society. I don't really see anything that says she's more predisposed to that because of her culture and geography. Delphine, on the other hand, um, it's really interesting. If you do look at the historical aspect of this um, with Delphine's character, there's a lot of narratives and newspaper articles and historical evidence saying that Louisiana was quite a hotbed of slave cruelty. Um, so it seems like Louisiana was pretty extreme in terms of racism and cruelty anyway, I think that definitely played into Delphine's perspective. Um, but of course, what's really interesting is that you have a very extreme place, very extreme slave laws. Louisiana had its own code for owning slaves that was different from the codes held in the rest of the American South. It was very interesting. So Louisiana had kind of altered their policies to say, yeah, we're allowed to be a little more cruel than other people. Um, so the fact that they had all of that in place anyway, and then Delphine transcended that is really interesting because obviously at that point it becomes more about her and who she is as a person. Um, so yes, I, I think in her case, I, I do think that culture and geography played into it a little bit, but it does raise the question, as you say, of you know, would she have been that extreme if she lived somewhere else, if she had grown up with a different set of social expectations? And I think that is kind of a central question at the heart of all of this is if she had had different opportunities, if her upbringing had been different, if she had been conditioned by different social norms, would she have been a different person? Would she have done the same things? And Coven does try to touch on that multiple times, especially by having nothing interact with women of color in the present. Um, she actually forms a couple of really close relationships with women of color where she begins to see them as people. And again, you can see her kind of working on dismantling her own racist beliefs, which I think is really interesting. And Coven does give us that little bit of hope of like, 
could she have dismantled that and become a better person under the right circumstances? And I think that's a really interesting thread for this entire project. And it's something I look forward to exploring in much greater detail. That's gonna be a central part of what this research project ultimately becomes. So thank you. Redemption through the Gothic. Yeah, yeah to have redemption through the Gothic is a great way of saying that, absolutely. Great. Well, thank you so much, Alyssa Caroline. Um, thank you. Yes. You know, obviously sparked lots of lots of interest uh, in the room around sort of these of genre and historical records um, and and the archives of women, I suppose. It, it, yeah, it definitely. Next to, um, I think, a lot of interest across the faculty um, from historians, philosophers, um, people in WSA working on, on women, women's archives in various ways. So thank you very much uh, for your presentation and thank you everyone for attending. Thank you so much for having me and thank you everyone for coming and thank you for all the questions. If anyone wants to message or connect with me afterwards, I would love to talk to you about this. Thank you for the really insightful questions. Great, it sounds like you and Ethan have got lots of conversations to have. I think so, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> the answer, Great. I'll text you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everyone. <laughs> Thank you. Have a great evening, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.